yourself away My God, why have you forsaken me? Remember the cry of Job. Listen to the cry of Jesus. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent, but you are holy enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, deliver them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man. This is Jesus. This is the cry of Jesus on the cross as David prophesied of the Messiah. I don't know what he saw as he wrote Psalm 22, but Jesus quotes and embodies Psalm 22 when he is on the cross. David wrote from the perspective of the Messiah. Remember, Job said, Oh, God is enthroned and is holy, but I am broken and in the dust. Jesus is on the cross, and as he feels the weight of the sin of the world, he cries, I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, He trusted in God. Let Him rescue Him. Let Him deliver Him since He delights in Him. I am poured out like water. And my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. Jesus cried out, I thirst. I thirst on the cross. See, Jesus is the answer of prayer for everyone who knows they need God but feel like he's too far away. Jesus Christ, the beauty of Jesus is he is the answer of prayer to every frustrated parent, every overwhelmed mom and dad that has sat in the driveway at home before they walked into family dinner and they were so frustrated at their work, they were so overwhelmed at the chaos of life, they were so broken at the direction of their family, they were so overwhelmed because their marriage has fallen apart that they cried and they said, God, we where are you? God, how can you identify with me? No, Jesus is the answer to that prayer. A God whose holiness is, feels like an unapproachable light is now approachable to broken people. Jesus knows what it is like to be you. 2,000 years later, and the Bible is still the best-selling book in all of history. It's still changing lives of people. How is it that a person can hear the word? Sister Lavinia, a person could hear the word of God. It goes into their ears. Something clicks in their brain. Their hearts are tugged. Their hearts are, their heartstrings are pulled upon. And, and something changes within them that they say they simply make a decision. Say, I repent. I'm going to follow Jesus. And in an instant, God can transform their lives. He can take a drug addict and clean up their lives. He can take an alcoholic and wash them clean. He can take an immoral person, a sinner, an evil, vile person, and transform their lives. That they have the power to overcome addiction. They have power to overcome vices. They can overcome temptation. Live a clean life. Live a godly life. Find peace and joy. Find the happiness that only can be found in a relationship with God I'll tell you what it is it's the resurrection power that can save you that can cause you to be born again if it's not true let's go read comics or do something else but if it's true it, the implications and he verified his word because he said I'm gonna die and I'm gonna raise up again if he didn't rise up let's forget about it. but he did exactly what he said it was gonna do that means his word is truth his word, his word will set you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Knowledge of truth is going to liberate you. It's going to set you free. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
And because Jesus resurrected from the dead, here's, here's the other implication. It means that everything that we do in living for God, in doing what is right, it means that it was worth it all because there will be a reward. Well, well pastor, how do you know? How do you know that? How do you know there's going to be a reward? Because Jesus showed us there is life after death. There is a reward. It will be too late to decide where you're going to spend eternity when you die. You've got to do it right now. Could it be that God sent us here? He sends people our way, text messages. That could be the voice of God trying to speak to us and bring us into a relationship with him. And when we come to recognize his voice and come to know that, let me tell you, all the good that you're doing, all the, all the persecution that you're suffering, all the pain that's been inflicted upon you, maybe even some of you here, your family's been against you since you've become a Christian and your friends have, have dropped you like a fly. And, and others have turned their back on you maybe you're at work and, and your workmates are persecuting you and they make fun of you and they laugh at you because you're a child of God because you refuse to cuss and you refuse to swear and you refuse to do bad things let me tell you it will be worth it all your reward shall be great in heaven how do I know because my faith is not in vain Ephesians chapter 6 tells us uh, to honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Honor your mother and your father. If you want things to go well in your life, if you want to live a long life, honor your father and mother. I don't really know how that works. Maybe if, if you don't upset your mother and father, they won't kill you, so you'll have a long life. Uh, this this lady was not a part of high society she was not a woman of status or honor in fact the bible tells us she lived uh, by the wall in a city called jericho and in this city uh, if you live by the wall it means it's one of the more uh, cheaper areas uh, of the the town it was not the expensive end of town but and she was also a woman of ill repute the bible calls her a harlot and uh, she's named that in scripture a harlot or a prostitute and yet she is listed in the hebrew in the book of hebrews 11 chapter 11's roll call of faith it says by faith the harlot rahab perished not with them that believed not you see even though she was a jerichoite uh, when the spies of Israel came into the city of Jericho, she, she took them in. She harbored them and allowed them to stay in her house so that they might be protected uh, from the Jerichoites who were trying to, to find them and kill them. And as a result of that simple gesture, uh, they said to her, if you would hang a scarlet cord outside of your window when the Israelites come, and you know the story of Jericho, the walls come tumbling down. Everybody in that city was destroyed except for Rahab and everybody that she was able to bring into her home. Amen. The whole city was destroyed, but this one house, the house of Rahab the harlot, and everybody that was with her, including her family, including her children, were spared from death. And so I, I can just imagine as the days would be coming for the Israelites to come, as they, they, they gathered around that city for six days, walking around, and finally on the seventh day, in that period of time, I can imagine her, uh, this woman Rahab going to all of her family and all of her, her siblings and all of maybe even her children to come into her house. Because that's where they were going to find safety. That's where they were going to find refuge in the house where she was. And as long as she could get them in the house, they would be safe. Amen. As long as she can get them in her home, under her roof, they would be safe. Amen. And that's a lesson for all of us brothers and sisters to learn. That whatever you've got to do, if you can continue to get yourself to the house of God, if you can continue to be a part of the kingdom of God, of the body of Christ, 
I know this is just a building. I, I know that it's just a time on Sunday, but I want you to know something. There's something special and powerful about coming into the house of God. And the best mothers and the best fathers are those who can get their children up on Sunday morning and say, we're going to the house of God. This is what we do. We are a part of the body of Christ. First John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 says, But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Indeed just means in works or in what you're doing. Don't just love in word. Don't just say love you, bro. But then when they need help, you don't help them. <laughs> don't just say, oh, we love all the churches overseas. But when they ask for money for a Bible school or they need help in funding the ministry, we don't give towards that. No, we need to not only love with our words, not only love with our lips, but we also have to love with our deeds, with our actions, with what we give and truth. That is why giving is so powerful. It is a tangible example of the love of God being expressed through you. They can see the love of God in what you are doing, in what you are giving, in what you are showing through what your action. We can't just say that we love, but we must show our love for one another. Listen to what Jesus had to say about this, and, and, and uh, Brother Ben mentioned it earlier. It, he talked about it in Luke chapter 6. Jesus said, and I love how the Amplified Version puts this passage, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure. They, and he, he, he referenced that. He said, man will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over with no space left for more. For with the standard of measurement you use, for with the standard of measurement you use when you do good to others, it will be measured to you in return. That is red letter in your Bible. Those are the words of Jesus. That's not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. He is the one that said that. He is the one that said that there is a cycle to this thing called generosity. There is a cycle to this thing that we talk about when we talk about giving. The blessed give to others. And because they give, they are blessed. The blessed give to others, and because they are willing to give, they are indeed blessed. But notice this. The size of your blessing is tied to the standard of giving that you set. No one is going to tell you what you need to give, but it is up to you to decide within your own heart. It is up to you to decide. It is up to me to decide with our own heart and with our own decisions how we are going to set the standard in our lives when it comes to giving. I don't know about you, but I truly do believe that the gospel has the ability to change the world. I do believe that the gospel has the ability to change eternal lives. Hallelujah. So why wouldn't I give? Why wouldn't I give to see the gospel preached wherever there is a preacher that is willing to preach it? Why, why wouldn't I want to support that? We can't just invest in those things. We should invest in things that are temporal, but we can't just invest in things that are temporal, but make sure that you are investing in the eternal things of God because he will be no man's debtor. Amen. God is never going to owe you. Feel your arms, wrap me in your